Welcome everyone to our buff. Um, I'm, I'm super excited that we all found our way here. Uh, it's a quite unusual format. Um, so let's see, let's make the best use of this as we are all figuring out how our tools work and how our video conferencing work. I'm gonna share my screen because to set the stage and start the conversation for our birds of feather, I prepared a few slides. The what I want to talk about is the challenges around open source metrics. And to recap what those challenges are, and these are only samples. I'm sure you have many more, and I would love to hear your own challenges afterwards. Then I want to talk about how together we can be better, stronger, faster in having open source metrics, specifically around the chaos project. And finally, I want to have that open conversation with you all. A little bit about myself. I recently, last year, earned a PhD and my focus was in open source, corporate engagement in open source through this very qualitative work interviewing, participating in open source, we heard that especially companies want to understand open source communities through metrics. And we had a session at the open source leadership summit three years ago in Lake Tahoe. And from that session, there was so much interest in open source metrics that we started the chaos project. So I'm one of the co-founders of the chaos project. And what that is, I will cover later. After I graduated, I joined Petrugia as the director of sales. And what, what really defines me is my mission to help open source communities, companies, foundations become professional in their use of open source metrics. And I do this through the work in the Chaos Project and through my work in Biturgia. So that is a little bit about me. When we look at metrics, the definition of a metric is a method of measuring something or the insights obtained from this measuring. And so the way I think of metrics is we have our open source communities, we have the project data, we have methods for collecting the data, for analyzing it, and then we have the insights that come from that. Now, this is an ideal situation, and there are several challenges to making this happen. Challenges I group in legal and ethical challenges, organizational challenges, and technological challenges. The legal and ethical challenges that I hear time and time again are around laws like GDPR, the European General Data Protection Regulation that empowers the data subjects, or in our case, they would be our community members, to have ownership of their data and have a say in how that data about them is being used or not used and even deleted. So that's a challenge if you want to have metrics about what is happening in our open source communities with our members. Data privacy, uh, especially if we go into diversity and inclusion, there might be a chance that we out someone. Um, so those are concerns. And then informed consent. This is something that especially is embedded in GDPR when someone gives us permission to analyze their data, um, usually there has to be an opt-in, but there are a few cases where opt-out is possible. So rather than our community members saying, yes, it's okay, there can be a gray area in open source where we say our community members have contributed to an open source community knowing that all of this is public and so because we're analyzing this to help the community, we have legitimate interest and we can opt out or we give our community members an opt out process where they can say, oh no, please do not analyze my data as part of your analysis. 
So those are some of the legal and ethical challenges that I keep hearing about. Going on to organizational challenges. Why do you, why do we measure open source communities? Why do we look at the data? That is something that should be answered by our metric strategy. We should know why we are starting to embark on a metric journey. And only by knowing what it is that we're looking for and why we're looking at it, can we actually get actionable insights? Because <laughs> our communities produce a lot of trace data. Um, this is just data that is created as our members interact with each other. Um, and so starting to analyze that is like opening a fire hose of data. And then another organizational challenge is buy-in from the community. Um, I have seen communities that embark on a metric journey themselves. So obviously there is buy-in. In other cases, the metrics might be generated by a foundation or a company where it's a little bit uh, more negotiation necessary with the community to make sure everyone knows what is happening and is on board with it. Now, moving on to technical challenges. Obviously, we need to get quality data. And getting that data into a format that we can analyze and making sure that there are no inconsistencies in the data we collect, making sure that we can access the APIs of the tools that our open source communities use. All of those are the technical challenges around getting data. Managing identities is a very interesting challenge because our community members use different logins, different usernames in different collaboration platforms, on emails, in Slack, on IRC, in GitHub, it's on, even on uh, Twitter. And if we assume that we want to understand our entire community, we need to somehow consolidate all of these different identities or profiles so that we can say this is actually the same person, which then gives us insights to the contributor journey, their activity throughout the different parts of the project and so on. And finally, we need to be able to do reporting visualization. That is how we make the data that we collect insightful and actionable. And how we do that is a challenge. Now, after looking through all of these challenges, I uh, want to recognize that there are uh, some super experts who can manage all of this, uh, but those super experts are rare. Um, being able to look at an open source community and say, hey, this is healthy community because of these aspects. There are some people who can do this, but as we heard in the keynote this morning, there are a lot of people coming into open source or tech in general who don't have that background, who don't have that knowledge. And so let's build together a tool set to go to be better, stronger, and faster around open source metrics. And so that is what the Chaos Project is about. It's to create analytics and metrics to help define community health, and to do that together. We started this project three years ago at the Linux Foundation um, with academics to really provide the rigor with tool makers like Eturgia to have software that provides open source metrics, with the practitioners from various companies and foundations who actually use metrics in their um, day job. So that is the background of chaos and how we got started. Moving on to better. Developing practices together helps us analyze communities as, at scale through metrics and figuring out how to do that. Um, by having shared practices or shared language around our metrics, gives us the ability to compare across communities to transfer our anal anal analysis analytic skills. Having 
open source metrics re can reduce our bias in decision making. We no longer have to rely on the grapevine to know what's going on in our communities. We can actually use data to manage our communities. And some communities have grown so large that there's no way a single person can know what's going on everywhere. But through the right metrics, we can actually get those insights we need. And even shared decision making, because we have an objective foundation to work from. And so if we have a governance model in our open source communities, where we have shared decision making, the metrics can help inform those decisions. So that is better. Moving on to stronger chaos metrics. We define chaos metrics in the chaos community. Um, the work is organized in working groups, and there are five of them. Um, diversity inclusion is a working group that looks at how do we understand how welcoming our communities are and how well do we include people in our processes. Risk is looking at business risk, at license risk, at um, the risk that communities go away because no one wants to be stuck with a project that they then have to maintain. And so understanding that risk is important. Evolution is a working group that looks at the growth, maturity, and decline of communities and defining metrics around, especially activity, what's happening on issue trackers and commits and different channels, and how's that evolving over time to understand that. Um, we have value metrics. Value metrics, what, what's the value of an open source project in on society as a whole, to other open source communities, to the individual contributors that are in the project, or the value to businesses that come to rely on the open source software in their innovation streams. So what are the metrics we can understand there? And the last working group, Common, is one we started because there are metrics that multiple of these working groups are relying on, like information about contributors or um, what is a commit or what, what are forks, how do we measure that, and which has multiple implications for other working groups. We combine those in a common working group to define that. So better, stronger, faster. We are moving on to faster. The Chaos Project is producing software to collect data from communities, present the metrics, analyze it. Um, the Grimoire Lab project is used by companies like uh, Red Hat and HashiCorp and Ericsson and others. Um, and Augur is a software we have for piloting new metrics and trying out ideas. Um, Pregit is another tool we have for looking at the commit history. Um, moving on to one last um, slide on lessons learned. So having had these conversations for three years now about community metrics, open source metrics, I, I hear a lot um, that we should listen. We should collect everything when we start our metric journey because we don't know yet what metrics might be interesting in the future and having that data ready allows us to change our metric strategy later. And we already have that foundation, especially when we start to implement changes in our communities to then uh, be able to say, uh, this was the baseline from before and here are the changes in our metrics afterwards. Also ask questions of the data to achieve your goals. Um, we use the GQM or the goal question metric approach in chaos to say, you have to start with your strategy. You have to understand why you're starting to look at metrics and to choose the metrics so that they support your understanding of whether you reach the goals you have for your open source community. Just looking at the easy to get metrics doesn't actually help you make any improvements. Also tell a story with the data. And just saying our commit count went up or down is not 
interesting enough or not insightful enough. You have to actually know the context of the community, understand why the change is happening. And if you don't know why, then start to dig a little deeper. Um, but let's say the number of new issues or issue comments is going up. It could be that there was a release that is super buggy and we have more uh, bug um, reports. Could be that there are more users suddenly who are asking questions, or it could just be that Google Summer of Code is around the corner and students are asking uh, questions because they're interested in participating. So know the context, tell the story. Avoid gaming of metrics. If we use metrics to incentivize our community members, then there is uh, the chance that they will focus their attention more on improving their metrics than actually advancing the community. And that can actually be detrimental to the community as a whole. And value all contributions. Um, we should not be limited to GitHub issues and commits just because those are the easy metrics to get. There are several resources I can recommend. We started a podcast where we like to share stories and uh, experience around open source metrics, community health. And if you have an interesting story, please reach out. I'm happy to get you on the podcast to tell your story. Look at the metrics. It's all on our website. Look at the software. And then if you also want to be participating in the chaos community amongst peers, then you're welcome to join us there, join the mailing list and our regular calls. They're open to everyone. So together we can build, together we can be better, stronger, faster about open source metrics. And I would like to have a conversation with you all. So if you could ask your questions in the question section, write in the chat or even raise your hand I ask to be on this platform so that we can actually bring you on stage so you can ask um, questions or just make a comment about your own experience. This is a birds of feather, so I'm not the smartest person in the room. We all have our own experiences to share, and I encourage you to take that opportunity. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And let's see, we have a question here. How do you think the metrics discovery and storytelling process changes between metrics for the company's purposes such as use in marketing, performance, et cetera, and metrics to tell a story about the community's health itself. Again, I, I don't have to be the one answering this. If anyone has thoughts on this question, please raise your hand. I'm happy to have you come on stage and share your own experience. From my own perspective, when we talk about open source metrics in an organization, there are business goals, objectives, strategies that need to be met. And so the metrics should support whether the company is achieving those goals. Uh, if the company has an open source programs office, that open source programs office has its own goals and reasons for existing and being able to show, yes, we are accomplishing why this um, OSPO was created can secure funding, make sure that the program is not being cut in the future, um, and even get more funding for an expanded operation. So it's, it's important to have that alignment with the goals. Community health on, is something that is interesting maybe in that context as well, um, because that might be something that introduces risk if it's missing or that um, the company just cares about as um, um, a goodwill kind of thing. Um, but I, I think the key focus in the organization is to really line 
the metrics with the business objectives. And if we are doing a report for an open source community, then we are much more concerned about the longevity of the community and telling the story from a very different angle. Um, on the Chaos Podcast, on Chaos Cast, we have an episode coming up with Ruth Cheesley, who is the community manager of the Mautic community. And she had to do internal reporting, but then used those same metrics analytics to craft them into a blog post and share them with the open source community. And the nice thing about that is it creates a dialogue with the community members on where the community is going, what the project um, is lacking or being good at, and it can actually drive uh, some changes. So let's see. Um, Here's another question. What are user metric proxies when your project has no server? And I assume this question is, how do we know how many users does um, our project actually have? Because in open source, as we, we know, is we don't like telemetry that much or having a call home from the software. Um, because that could be considered spying on our users and might be unethical. So I, I see um, Vinya raised th their hand. Um, do you want to jump in here and talk about this? Hello. Am I hearable? Hey. Yes. I'm hearable. Great. Um, I like this question. Thank you for asking this question. Um, I think it's really important because um, we're entering an age now with uh, security becoming one of the most major factors of what metrics you choose or don't choose uh, to view in your customer value journey. Um, and coming from an LGBTQ standpoint um, in my past, I spent a lot of time talking about like, how do you count people who are closeted or aren't available in your community? And in a lot of ways, it's very, very difficult to tag a number to someone who explicitly doesn't want to be seen. And it's kind of similar uh, if you don't have a server or you don't have the technical capacities to find that number. Maybe there are ways qualitatively to get that number and it's okay if it's not intensely accurate because accuracy doesn't matter so much as usefulness. So if you can find a truth, that's great. Get good, then get better. If you can find a more useful truth, switch over to it. And so some, some ways of uh, getting some insights to number of users, um, these are not exact sciences, um, but I've seen people use um, number of people asking questions on Stack Overflow or issues and so on as um, um, as indicators of more or fewer users, user activity. Um, in in the case of LibreOffice, I just had a conversation with um, them. They're looking at um, estimating how many computers there are and what percentage um, of those computers they have based on surveys and experience. So th those are those are some ways that user count can be estimated. If it's a software like open SSL and we know it's in almost every server, then we can count how many servers there are, um, or there are at least estimates out there to use. So th those are some thoughts on getting a sense for how many users there are. Um, creating a user community is 
uh, valuable thing to do. Um, having the engagement of those users and that can give you an idea, but I also realized that not everyone is actually willing to um, to join a user community. Many people are just happy using an open source software and never declaring that they use it. Um, let's see, here's another question. Once we are in the beginning, what kind of metrics can we get to know our user's profile? We used to have a registration, but developers were not registering and not trying out our technology. Um, so I'm, I have to make a few assumptions here. It sounds like a registration for developers. So this open source tool is for developers who are the users. Um, so they are not the developers of the actual tool, but the developers using that open source software. Um, to to get insights on who those users are, um, unfortunately, there is no good way to do it besides asking them to self-identify. Um, at least I have not seen anything in practice. If anyone here on this buff has any ideas, please jump in, share your insights. Here's another question. Are there any plans to move to cloud in a sense of GitHub application or software as a service? Talking about Grimoire Lab. The answer is yes, there is a cloud version. Um, I can't type, it's called Cauldron. Cauldron.io is an early alpha version of Grimoire Lab where you can just plug in, can I answer here? I'll put in the chat. So if you go to cauldron.io, it's a neat platform. You can uh, just enter your GitHub organization or user, and it starts collecting data about that repositories inside that organization. And you can add multiple organizations or whatever project repositories you want to analyze. Um, Cauldron also supports GitLab, um, any generic Git repository that is publicly available, and meetup data. And in the future, Cauldron will support more data sources and be providing other kinds of analytics. But it's built on the same Grimoire Lab technology. And so I, I understand that I didn't talk about Grimoire Lab during the slides. So I'll just give a little bit background. Grimoire Lab is a tool set developed by Biturgia um, based on 15 plus years experience on in doing research into open source communities and projects. And then for eight years ago, Biturgia was started from this open source research team to actually provide metrics and insights to um, companies because they were asking for it. They were willing to pay for it. And about four years ago, the company completely rewrote the metrics platform. And this is what we now call it the Grimoire Lab software. And it's a collection of different tools to ingest data, clean the data, have processing on it, do the identity matching, and then have the consistent reporting and dashboarding. And so cauldron.io uses the same technology under the hood, but scales differently in the cloud and makes the management of the platform much easier. So thank you for that question. Again, this is uh, birds of a feather. So I, I don't have to be the one talking here. Um, I'm happy to let any of you come on stage and share your experience and your stories and 
ask the other attendees um, questions. So here, here's another very interesting question. How can I know if my numbers are good or not? Where can I find benchmarking? For example, we are 100 people in our Telegram community, but only 10% are engaged in answering questions. Is that good? The, so the question for that, um, and I see Vinya raised their hand again. I'm happy to have you come on stage if you want to take this question. I'm, I see myself here as a facilitator. I'm happy to talk, but if yeah. anyone else wants to talk, I'm happy to give space. I like this whole stage thing, but I kind of feel like it's adding a lot to like power distance or whatever. So it's like literally stepping up to a mic in a real place. There's just a certain level of anxiety to it. It's kind of fun, but I don't know. <laughs> well, thank you, Vinya, for stepping up to the mic. Yeah, I hope my mic is actually good. <laughs> um, so kind of regarding this, I, I feel like it's an important question to ask. And I kind of think that we should spend some time getting multiple answers for this, um, because ultimately determining the activity level of a individual community depends on where you come from. I'm a marketer slash a brand community manager. So I spend a lot of time looking at power users, um, of which only about 2% will be there. Um, but on the flip side, I also spend a lot of time running Love Our Lurkers campaigns um, in order to get that 40% of people who are just reading to actually raise their hands and say, I'm here. So it largely depends, I think, on the value that you're providing essentially an invisible audience. How do you determine what's actually useful and what's not useful? Because um, you can't force people to make comments. I think it's an interesting question. And benchmarking is going to have to be based on week over week activity in your own group, not some statement about Georg or me or anyone else in this group saying, no, yeah, 10% seems fine or 40% is a little bit high. Um, national benchmarking seems important, but you have to ask yourself, is it a vanity metric in relation to the community that you're running? Absolutely. Uh, benchmarking against your own history is one way to know whether your current 10% is good, an improvement, or if there was a loss in activity, which could be a warning sign. Yeah, um, especially as your community grows, that number will change. Uh, smaller communities tend to have larger participation per user base, whereas as you get larger and larger, your lurkers start to outpace it. So you'll see that percentage go down week over week. Yeah, and then if you actually want to benchmark, um, something that during my PhD we have tried, um, I, I wasn't the one actually doing the work, but we had someone on our research team who um, was pursuing this idea that we can compare different projects and we can just choose one that is similar to our own. And to mm -hmm. say, we take a benchmark to a similar. So uh, if we were to take countries, there's no point in comparing the GDP of um, a really wealthy ODC country with a country that has does not have that infrastructure and the history of having uh, free markets and everything. Um, they're just very different. And the same is true in open source communities. We have very different governance structures. We have very different uh, collaboration patterns. Even projects that use GitHub have different ways of leveraging GitHub to get the work in the communities done. Um, I mean, in extreme case, some use the pull request process for getting contributions or even as a maintainer doing contributions while others just push straight to master. And measuring that activity level um, means something different in the communities. So as we do benchmarking comparison, it's we have to make sure that we compare apples to apples. Um, another 
Another related comment on this is quality models. Since the beginning of open source community measurement and open source metrics, there have been attempts to say a healthy community has these characteristics and we can build a quality model that takes the metrics in, defines thresholds, um, you know, like 10% of partic active participation is good. So it gets a green light. Um, whereas if it's less, it gets an orange or red light. These quality models can be very powerful for managing a program of open source communities for keeping tabs on uh, many different projects and to say, oh, there's something going on here. I, we should look into this. The work of defining quality models, however, and there are several in the academic literature, the problem is that everyone has slightly different criteria. And so there is no unified open source quality model that has been transcending or found useful by someone else than the person or the group that created it. Um, when we started the chaos project, actually, we had a tool uh, contributed to the project that, that did exactly that, that took the metrics in and then had the um, stoplight, red, green, yellow, uh, for the projects and you could parameterize it was really awesome. But the way the tool worked didn't make sense to others. And so it, right now it's in the attic. <laughs> if anyone wants to continue that work, uh, please let us know. We were happy to t take the software back out of the attic and have a community around it. So I see there are some chat messages. And again, if anyone wants to come on stage and ask a question, I believe we still have 10 minutes left. So plenty of time. I'm just reading the chat right now. Okay, so it looks like in the chat we are uh, Vinya and Carol and Ilvanimi are still talking about the how do we benchmark. So that's that's awesome. Um, let's see, we talked about several things. Um, one thing that I, I find really interesting is around gaming of metrics. I'll, I'll just keep rambling on until someone interjects, raise a hand, um, ask a question or something. Um, gaming, gaming metrics is something that from the very beginning of the chaos project has been discussed. And the idea is that you get what you measure or if you measure, you have to be careful what you measure because you might just get that. So, so you get the sentiment and it shapes behavior. Once we start measuring behavior, people will respond to that and adjust their behavior. The, the There are several things we have discussed to mitigate that. One is to not provide metrics at the individual contributor level because if it's just a group effort then it's not as strong an individual incentive to shape the behavior to improve the metrics um, then also be very mindful about what changes you want to make in the community and what metrics can indicate those changes are successful and then try to guide the participation in that way. But then also reevaluate after a while because the goals may have changed and the behavior that 
we were trying to incite at first might no longer be the behavior we need in that moment or we have reached our goal and it's time to focus on something else. So we have to reevaluate our metric strategy and change the metrics that we highlight and focus on. Okay, here's another question. Gaming is an awesome topic. What plans or tactics do you all recommend once it comes to brass tacks to ensure that the gamification metric doesn't infringe on natural organic activity in the group? People usually worry about gamification backfiring. Now, I'm not familiar with the term brass tacks. So I'm sorry, that might just be that I'm not a native English speaker. Um, so Minya, if you could elaborate what brass tacks is. But going on into, into um, gamification, if any of you here on this Birds of Feather call session uh, have thoughts on this, please write in the chat or raise your hand and uh, take the microphone. So um, gamification, what I talked about so far was um, don't provide individual metrics because then people don't have an incentive to game their own metrics. Um, be very mindful about what metrics to highlight and focus on, and especially what incentives are tied to which metrics. And then reevaluate regularly whether those are still the goals um, of the community, whether you have reached the goals or should focus on something else. Brass tax, when the rubber meets the road. Okay. So that's uh, on gaming. Um, I'm also asked often about the ethical and legal challenges. And I, I can reiterate and expand on what I was sharing earlier. The, the best strategy is to be as transparent and open with your community as you can. Um, because the, if we look at the legal side of things, and again, you should probably ask the lawyer um, for your specific context and goals, but the legal context seems to be that unless someone complains, we're good. And by being open and transparent and providing ways for people to, or for our community members to opt out and have a say in the community metric strategy, um, we can mitigate that upfront. So there've been some messages in the chat. Yes, uh, the patches metric where people then create smaller, almost trivial patches just to update their, up their metrics. Yeah, good, good example. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I know another community was having plus one, plus two um, upvotes and the game turned into waiting for someone experienced to make a plus two upvote and then doing your own plus one right after that. So you're reviewing code or I don't remember the exact context where this happened, but <laughs> it turned into a not so useful exercise um, because you were earning status by doing these reviews and providing plus one plus two votes. Um, I also like um, Vinya 
Vinya is uh, also active in the open source, in the chaos project. And Vinya, if you're okay with coming on stage again, you have a really nice metaphor about dashboards and reports. And before I say your, your metaphor that I learned from you, I want to give you the chance of maybe um, sharing that yourself. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Yeah. Um, so this isn't actually my metaphor. I want to be very clear. This actually came from Chris Mercer. He goes by Mercer uh, at measurementmarketing.io. Uh, he's a measurement marketer. And I have found that this is one of the most important ways for uh, communities to look at how you're building out stuff. Um, so when I think of a dashboard, I think of a dashboard on a car, right? You're going 75 miles down the highway. Um, you want to know how fast you're going, whether you should slow down, speed up, stop, or if your engine's on fire. Those, that's four, maybe five metrics. So what are those four or five metrics for you? Then once you discover that your engine is smoking, something happened, you pull over to the side of the road and you ask yourself, okay, what happened? Um, that's the point where you open up the hood and you have a whole bunch of extra metrics. Uh, was it oil? Was it gas? Was it fluids? Uh, did something happen to my carburetor or was it my belt? And understanding how that engine runs, understanding how your community's engine runs, gives you an understanding of what you should check first, what you should check last, and what to do about it. So dashboards should be a chief few metrics that tell you whether you're doing well, keep going, hit the brakes, slow down, and your reports, your detailed inclinations and everything like that, they should be out of your sight while you're driving. When something does happen, that's when you open up the hood and you take a look at your report metrics. Yeah, thank you. I, even though the metaphor might not come from you, it will always be attributed to you in my mind because I learned it from you. <laughs> yeah, and um, I probably shouldn't say this here necessarily, but I am working on getting Mercer onto a chaos cast so we can hear it straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Um, and uh, we'll kind of discuss that a little bit more on chaos cast as we move forward into the future, I guess. I'm so looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I I think we have about a minute left, uh, Vinya. If you want to stay on, if you have any thoughts, mm -hmm. um, you can do that. If anyone else has any ideas, uh, any questions, last minute thoughts, please use the chat or the questions feature here. Um, in in any case, I, I thank you for joining us for this birds of a feather in this very new format. I appreciate all of your questions and engagement participation. We can head over to the Slack channel um, with pound sign to track community leadership OSPO to do and continue the conversation there. If um, And I'll be there for the next uh, two days just hanging out um, so ping me there. Uh, you can also start an individual conversation. So agreed. I just yeah. saw clapping hands rise up. How do you do that? <laughs> oh, that is so much fun. <laughs> oh, there's an, I, you know, I was trying to figure out how to do emoticons on individual chats. It looks like they just do the Facebook live thing going on here. I actually have a question. I hope you don't mind, but just something super simple. What is everyone's vote on whether the last icon is prayer hands or two people high-fiving? I kind of want to know where people wait that. I honestly don't know. Um. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even think it was prayer hands for the longest time. And it, it, I thought it was two people high-fiving, but it makes sense because the uh, sleeves are both the same color. It's interesting. And I think anyway. when I when I um, look at the emoticons um, here on my Mac, I think it does say they're prayer hands as the official name for them. 
yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I've never thought of them as high fiving. Yeah, a lot of people just started using them as high fiving in a few of the other online conferences I've had since COVID. It's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway. I also think of them as a thank you or something along the Yeah. Way. I God, guess God. no. The Mac just says hands pressed together. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Yeah, that's Let's close mm -hmm. the session. We're out of time. Thank you so much. Yeah. Also, great thank you to Amy. Amy has been the host in the background helping me with this session. So thank you very much. Have a good rest of your conference. <laughs>